and welcome to the Subversive Symposium. I'm uh, Russell Sandberg and I'm the author of Subversive Legal History, a manifesto of the future of legal education published by Routledge. And in that book, I argue that legal history should be at the beating heart of legal education and what law schools do. And that book is very much addressed uh, to lawyers and to legal educators and to legal historians about their field, but hopefully it's of interest to others outside the field. And hopefully it can do something to help bridge um, the gap uh, between legal historians and historians who are interested in law uh, in history departments. And so with that in mind, um, what we've been doing, I say we, it's, 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 it's me, that's, that's, that's the format. Uh, what we've been doing, Royal we what we've been doing is having a series of conversations with experts about their work and also about the themes um, of the book. And um, we've had a number of conversations um, with legal historians and also we're having conversations with people who work on the history of law, but in history departments. And with that in mind, I was very long winded, uh, introduction. But with that in mind, uh, I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Jennifer Aston, a uh, senior lecturer in the history department at Northumbria University in Newcastle. Uh, so thanks very much for joining me. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself and then we can start chatting away? Yeah, so um, my research originally was um, business history. So I've looked at um, female business owners in 19th century uh, England. And that was my PhD topic um, and took up quite a lot of my, my attention and, and a lot of time because when I had started writing about or researching female business ownership, the field was very much that they didn't exist. Um, and a lot of the, the kind of conversations I had at conferences and with other academics was kind of proving that they did. And so there was a lot of counting involved. So I suppose my, my kind of background is more economic history and, and business history, because like I said, there's a lot of counting of women. But thankfully, as I was kind of progressing through my, my PhD, there were some um, great books came out by people like Hannah Barker and um, Alison Kay, Nicola Phillips. And uh, Nicola Phillips especially was um, kind of a legal history of women in business. Um, and so I started to sort of, to sort of pull out and draw upon their work and think actually, well, how were women doing business? So we kind of got to the point where there was still half my thesis was kind of counting women to say that they did exist and they existed in big numbers. Um, and then another part of it was looking at, well, how were they functioning? Because when, when we talk about women in the 19th century, virtually I think the last thing that anybody would come up with if you ask, you know, what would a woman be doing? Would be saying, you know, or running their own business. Partly because the law said they couldn't. You know, if they were a married woman, suddenly they enter this really weird kind of world where they don't exist as a legal entity for, for the you know, vast majority of the century. Um, so that question actually of, of subversion came up quite early in my research, which ties really nicely to today. But, um, but kind of w one of the things that I realized that right at the end of writing up my, my PhD was that by virtue of the sources I'd used, so I'd looked a lot of trade directories and probate records of, of women that I'd found, um, they were actually all successful in a kind of business history definition of the word because they were solvent they existed so therefore they hadn't failed um, and that kind of thing created a bit of a question when I was finishing my, my thesis it was like well it's too late to go back and do anything about that now but this is something for the future so um, during a, a fellowship I then started looking at um, small businesses in England and Wales that were male and female owned um, and using board of trade records to kind of look at how they failed and, and bankruptcy legislation and, and how they were treated. Because again, married women are this almost unique category of adults. You know, I think that the legislation, the way it's worded is, you know, they're alongside um, imbeciles and children as legal categories of because they, they, they can't be treated the same by the law. And the Board of Trade hates this, by the way, this isn't something that the Board of Trade is condoning by any stretch. They have the special sections of reports where they're saying about, you know, married women who are trading with husbands and doing it in such a way that they can protect assets and stop them being seized by creditors. And so there's that, especially with that project was really examining how people were using the system. And I think as well, this is actually a, a, um, an acquaintance of mine was saying the other day, who's a tax lawyer, was saying that the British have a particular um, sort of character trait that many other countries don't where they see a rule or they see a law and they like to bend it in any which way they can 
Um, and, and I could definitely see that in the bankruptcy legislation was the way that, you know, this was what the letter of the law was. And there was nothing to do with the spirit of the law. It was just, you know, what can we get away with in this? Um, so I think kind of, yeah, I've always been interested in how people have worked around the law, how they've worked with it. And, and actually, in terms of a business history approach, how the marketplace has functioned with laws that maybe don't make a lot of sense. You know, and on paper, you can't quite understand how people can do things. Um, and, and actually, one of the Board of Trade records that I had come across um, was a woman who had been declared bankrupt by virtue of a, um, a libel trial. So she had been found guilty of libel and slander by her lover's wife um, following her own divorce. And so that was the rabbit hole I fell down where I've then ended up looking at divorce law and being much more kind of focused on a, a legal history approach rather than the business background. Um, but I feel I've waffled on enough about, about me. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, that, that's, that's fascinating. And the idea of sort of stumbling, well, not stumbling, but, but, but discovering something where on paper it looks impossible, but in practice it's happening. And then seeing that actually as evidence of not something happening in the shadow of the law or outside the law, but the law being circumvented and used and played with. Because those are the very things which I think we often forget about. Um, sort of, although it's 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 the bread and butter of what lawyers do, you know, in, in, in terms of it, it's always about stretching a, a, a rule or a law, isn't it? In terms of you know trying to work out two sides on it. Um, it's nevertheless, I think, you know, we, we sort of present the law as if it's this rational, um, fixed, but also working um, system. And it's, it, it, it's all, you know, I think one of the lessons of history, whether that's, you know, what you've been looking at or for tax law or whatever, shows that actually, as your colleague said, you know, that act of circumventing the law, that act of being creative with the law, is actually key. And I think that's, you know, hopefully a, a message of the book is, is that, you know, teaching students legal history is a way of impressing that on them. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I mean, my God, you know, the number of really key lessons which can be taken from your research, you know, e even from that sort of blueprint which you just, you know, expressed in terms of you know, not taking things at face value, um, of going beyond what looks like a legal full stop. Um, because that's the interesting thing, is it's, it's a full stop rather than, well, it's, it's, it's also a prohibition, I suppose, but it, it, what's interesting there is that it's, like I say, it's, it's not a question of um, going, it's 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 evading rather than breaching the law. Yeah, I mean they're, it's, they're it's not stretching, setting out isn't it? to be. Yeah, they're not setting yeah. out to be radicals. I don't mm. think you know. I think they they're just doing. They're just existing. A lot of the women that I've that I've studied, um, you know, then I've certainly never sort of got the sense that they're perceiving themselves as trailblazers or you know as um, sort of radical feminists or anything like that. You know, yeah. they're just they're just existing. They're just creating. Um, they're just generating an income. They're providing for their families. They're they're just being. You know, this is just just life. But I mean, I think I think for sort of historians and um, and for legal historians as well, that you know they, they can be part of our fold. <laughs> but you know, for, for historians looking looking back, you know, it's it's the rule breakers that are fundamentally interesting. Um, but some it didn't occur to me until I was probably you know far further on in my research than I should have been. But um, that actually that you know the law in terms of like these big cases that happen mm -hmm. that decide a a statute or you know like uh, sort of make a big a big sort of splash about this is what will follow now they mm -hmm. only happen if somebody generally gets really marked about something you know for a lot of the time it might just pass you know it might just happen it might just get brushed aside it might just be or a sympathetic judge will say actually do you know what in this case this is maybe right you know and, and it will go on it it really sort of um i had a bit of a eureka moment when i suddenly mm. thought actually this is only when there's something that someone is determined to make a point of and it doesn't really matter like you know whoever that person might be but you know that this is the, the law kind of 
it's functional as well as being a you know black and white on a page as being a text um and i think that that kind of um the idea of the, the subversion and the pushing that law and pushing the letter of the law and kind of bending rules and things i mean it can be seen in the bankrupt women so clearly you know what one of the couples i looked at or a mr and mrs jones from wales and he um they had a dairy farm and he stayed in Wales and ran the dairy farm and she opened a dairy and provision dealership in King's Cross. So the train line was, was connected and they were bringing the produce from the farm and selling it um, in London. And, and everything was fine um, until she sort of overextended. They, I think they, they tried to extend into the shop next door and then things started to fall apart and the creditors said, no, this isn't. So they pushed her into bankruptcy. Now, as a married woman, she could trade apart from her husband and that protected his assets so she was trading on her own and it was only her kind of bits of the business that could be seized and um, but when the credit i'm um, sorry that when the um, official receiver so the officer from the board of trade turns up she had sold all the um assets of the business to her husband for a pound the day before he arrived so the creditors were left with nothing like all the fixtures and fittings from the shop all the stock and trade everything had been sold and was on its way back to wales so you'd by she didn't break any law. She did exactly what the law was allowing her to do. And the Board of Trade of sort of every year are saying to, to the government, you know, this isn't right. This is this is not what should be happening. Um, and so there's all sorts of interesting questions about, well, then were married women less likely to get any kind of credit or to get, you know, were, were male traders less likely to want to trade with them because they know that there's that potential for, for fiddling? Um, but, you know, we talk a lot about women being oppressed and being subjected to a patriarchal system. And they, they absolutely were. And I'm sure I'll go on about that at length <laughs> later on. Um, but but I, I really don't like it when the agency of people who were theoretically subject to the law is taken away as well. Because actually, you can see um, in the 19th century, I think, um, is especially interesting because you have not just the legal pressures but societal pressures as well um, but you can see that kind of like say gentle subversion just you know happening all the time and then obviously there's the kind of the, the biggest splash moments where you think you know wow that was really sticking it to them you know they were really that was a deliberate effort to kind of shock the system that I do at the moment for second years uh, for history undergraduates um, is a course called um, Being an Independent Woman. And it looks at how women in the, the long 19th century, so we kind of go from like a bit flexible with the dates. So we're roughly kind of 1780 ish through to about 1920. But we look at how women are able to do things that perhaps the historiography hasn't always recognized their participation in. But a really important part of that module is there's two weeks that I do on, on politics and the law. And essentially we sit and we go through statutes that impacted on women's lives. Because I think if you don't understand what the letter of the law says, then you can't possibly understand how they're doing things against it, how they're subverting it, or how they're doing something more interesting. And you don't know either what, what kind of um, context they're, they're living in. Um, so I think it's a really important part. It's not something, I, I don't think it's something that's kind of necessarily a standard part of history lessons as such but I, there has I've have noticed since I've been paying more attention to what the law actually says and um, there's quite a lot of common misconceptions in historiography of statute and and what it actually meant and it, you know I still find it very confusing and I'm kind of petrified of making the same mistakes and um, so I, I do think there's a, a really important kind of crossover between law and history that that needs to happen more than it is at the moment. Well yeah I, I like the idea of sort of the low level subversion um, as opposed to, to, to the big splashes, because of course the problem is lawyers miss that because our focus is on you know the higher level courts, um, and as a result, you know the focus is only on stuff that is litigated about in the first instance, and then is litigated about in a way that there's money to go up from mm -hmm. the court system. So, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult to know, even today, it's, it's, it's very difficult to know what are, you know, the standard issues in the lower courts and, 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 and the lower tribunals, let alone what then are the ways in which people are operating in order to avoid going in yep. to, 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 to that legal system. And, you know, it, it was interesting to, to hear what you were saying in terms of sort of, you know, that these were not radical 
women um, necessarily in, or, and wouldn't have seen themselves as, as, as being radical. And I quite like the idea of how mundane um, sort of playing with the law is. And I think perhaps we forget that in a way, particularly those of us who are sort of professionally dealing with the law all the time, we forget the mundane ways in which we sort of just play with the law or react to the law and, without thinking. And, and, and so, yeah, you know, this, 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 this is fascinating. So, and, and also, I can see absolutely how, you know, someone's view of what a 19th century statute means based on what it says mm -hmm. and based on what perhaps if it's gone before the higher court, what they've said about it could and is likely to be very different to what the how it was actually used and understood and 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 played with so yeah i mean it, it's it's i mean it, it sounds to me as if you've kind of done a double reveal and that you've revealed that these people exist um and and then revealed that as a result what we think we know about the law is very much a partial picture if that yeah, makes sense I think so, yeah, and, and I think the, the Married Women's Property Acts are always a really interesting one for me because when you um, sort of look at the way they've been viewed, not just by feminist historiography in women's history and gender history, but but kind of by wider, you know, historians of the 19th century. I mean, you get fewer historians now that just say, I'm a 19th century historian, I, you know, I do everything in this, you know, it's much, everyone seems to be much more niche now. But, um, but when you look at kind of those big broad surveys, of 19th century history, you know, the, the Married Women's Property Act are, are right up there with kind of the, some of the most important legislative changes and political changes. But when you look at the Hansard record of, of the MPs discussing these changes, there's um, an MP, uh, Gurney, his name is, and, and he makes this statement saying, but, you know, we need to put this through because everybody who's sit sitting in the house, who of course at that point, all men, we all provide for our daughters in this way. And so we we already create marriage settlements. We already give them um, trusts. We already settle land on them. They're already protected. But he, I think he cites that you know sort of several hundred thousand families who don't earn the money that you need to create a trust. You know, it's not worth paying to put a tiny amount of money into trust because the, the you know the, the income from it would be so small. And he said, you know, so actually the middle and the upper classes, we're already doing this. We've already got this protection. We know the law's stupid. We know that coverture is not a good thing for women. We're not awful to our daughters. So we recognize this. And so we give them provision. We work outside of the law and, and we have created this, this system and it works really well for us. But people who are further down the social ladder can't afford to do that. They don't have access to um, the, the legal professionals that, that they would need to to be able to do it they can't afford it they also don't have the capital to set up those kinds of trusts so what we need to do is to protect the income of a man's wage coming into the house and make it so that a wife if she's earning some money can can hold that herself she's not dependent on him coming home with his wage packet and not having gone to the pub straight away you just say even within kind of the 1860s 1870 parliament they recognized that you know, to put it, to put it, the law's an ass, you know, and that it doesn't work properly and that there are problems with it. But rather than fixing the whole law, you know, they just fix this tiny bit. Um, but, you know, they, they point to an earlier subversion and then they create a new one to be able to make it work. Absolutely. Um, well, it, it, it's that sort of pragmatic piecemeal approach mm -hmm. of, of sort of English law and, and sort of what's interesting about that is, is the extent to which it masks and perhaps even encourages fixes and 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 encourages developments which are not contrary to law but are nevertheless based on a very generous interpretation of law or, or a way of sort of you know well, circumventing um the law yeah and 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 and, and absolutely yeah, it, it's sort of like I say, it, it, it's, it, it, it reveals, I think, quite a lot about not just the women, but also the system 
Yeah. Um, and, and, and also the lawmakers, because it, it kind of, you know, what, what you were just saying kind of rebuts images that we automatically have of Victorians um, and, and, and Victorian men and Victorian lawmaking men and patriarchal Victorian lawmaking men. You know what I mean, and and so yeah, it 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 it, it sounded more and more as a sort of a as as as, a, as as an account which is is really transformative in that it's doing what history should do when history isn't well. Everybody questions what you think you know. Yeah, I think. I mean, I don't want to go too far and be sort of saying that you know. No. Um, Victorian lawmakers were feminist too. <laughs> um, you know, I think because Ben Griffin actually in a really really interesting article, um, I think it's been past and present about um, child custody legislation. He said, you know, there were steps forward, and actually, child custody legislation is one of the things that surprised me when I started looking sort of into kind of the mar you know laws that are associated with marriage and family life and things like that. In that, how similar, how how, the, how quickly something that we would recognize as today's legislation appears in the 19th century. It actually seems quite progressive and, and quite quick. But as, um, as Ben Griffin says, he says, you know, the law's not created by accident. And so when these progressive sort of amendments or um, acts are introduced, so things like, you know, the Infant Custody Act that gives, in 1839, that gives mothers rights to their children for the first time, they're incremental steps or the Married Women's Property Act of 1870, which lets people, um, women keep their own wages. You know, it's a tiny incremental step. Even after 1870, you know, married women still don't exist in the law. You know, they're still, they haven't, it's not got rid of coverture. It hasn't blown the whole system out of the water. It's given that tiny incremental step that will let society function practically maybe, and perhaps diffuse some of the, the pressure for reform. I mean, the, the 1857 Divorce Act is a kind of key thing. You know, there's so much pressure for reform to happen, both socially and from lawmakers themselves. But once it's happened, it's then, you know, sort of um, not really sort of substantial changes until the 1920s. And women are still disadvantaged until then. You know, they still can't divorce on equal grounds till men, um, you know, for like another 70 years. So, the, and the reason being that, well, Griffin argues that, you know, men are trying to, the patriarchy wants to uphold its status. You know, if you're in charge and you have this brilliant system that works excellently for you and keeps other people down, like it takes a very special society to say, actually, I don't, we'll reject this altogether and we'll all be equal. You know, they want to keep their position of privilege. And, and so they do, they kind of do the minimum that they need to do at every stage to make, you know, to send less, lessen that pressure for reform and, and to kind of keep society functioning. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's crazy because it's only going to be this year, you know, in a few months, that there'll be a no blame divorce. As I was mm. talking to some colleagues in Australia and they, they thought I was joking, <laughs> but we've had that since the 1970s. You know, so it's, um, it, it's a very, very slow process. Yeah, and it's it sort of, it's, yeah, I, I mean, I hadn't quite thought of it in, 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 in those ways, but it's sort of pragmatic, what seems to be compromises, mm -hmm. although they could be seen, I suppose, more as concessions. Um, which then also would serve to kind of put the genie back in its bottle. Mm -hmm. Because you then sort of think, well, you know, we've done this now. Um, you know, that that area is reformed. And you look at it and you go, you, you, you've moved an inch. You've, you know, you've, 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 made, you've made the minimum amount of change which was possible, which, which could have been done because that poss possibly is all that could have been done politically at that time. But it's sort of, you know, we talk about the common law as being this sort of pragmatic, I mean, just all generally about being this pragmatic piecemeal development thing. But I think that sometimes clouds the fact that, yes, it's piecemeal, um, but it's the pace of the piecemeal change, piecemeal change um, is incredibly slow and incredibly stop start. Yeah. And, I mean yeah. I was just going to say the Married Women's Property Act are again a great example because you have the first in 1870, then it's kind of so badly worded and, and drafted that they have the second in 1882, which extends a little bit more. And then finally the third in 1893, you know, so sort of over 20 years, mm. there's this kind of like, you know, returning to the same question, essentially, um, to be able to, to, to make changes there. 
Um, but I mean, you know, all of this as well is, is entirely reliant on having, for, for laws relating to women, is entirely reliant on having sympathetic people, sympathetic men in the, in the House of Parliament, you know, having um, sympathetic solicitors and barristers for the majority of the 19th century, because, you know, it's not until the early 20th that women can hold those positions. So it's entirely dependent for women getting, um, you know, changes to, to laws relating to them, that, that, that there's either an interest, you know, there's a purpose to men being able to get that reform made, or they have somebody who's willing to say, actually, this just isn't right on a human level. Um, you know, I don't know, Thomas Telford and, and uh, John Stuart Mill kind of spring to mind as, as obvious examples, you know, of MPs who were willing to to go that step, uh, you know, further, but also subject to ridicule as well for, for doing so. You know, so it's, um, yeah. Well, as I was say, I, I wonder whether that's actually, with hindsight, useful, because it's sort of what you then get is you get sort of heat and attention on both ends of the spectrum, if I can put it like that, in terms of sort of, you know, you get attention in terms of the, the smallest change you can make. And these people of you are, are sort of arguing for really radical change, the most reform you can make. And I've kind of run out of hands at this point, the analogy, but <laughs> you, you, you kind of want someone there, yeah, <laughs> if that I makes mean, sense. Um, because it, it's sort of, you know, over here is politically not possible. Um, and, and over here is politically possible, but of limited use. And so, you know, you, you went somewhere in the middle. I, I remember um, I, I wrote a book on marriage law reform last year, but it was published last year, wrote it the year before. But, um, and one of the questions that sort of came up on, on that from sort of people who were reading it was, you know, well, why do, aren't you arguing for complete reform of the system? Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I want to argue stuff that could politically be done. Um, you know, I, 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 there are books and there are articles and there are people arguing the, the extreme over here of let abolish marriage or let abolish state marriage or let abolish religious marriage. And I sort of, you know, there's also people over here who say, let, let's do little reforms like sort of outdoor weddings. And I, again, wanted to be <laughs> a head banger in, 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 in the middle, but... I hadn't thought of that in terms of, you know, these sort of reform tactics in the 19th century and whether actually having your mill, you know, John Stuart Mill, m making a, a radical case is actually counterproductive in that it sort of cheeses people off and puts people off the reform and also makes it sound as if that's the only option over there. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, that, that's what the Chartist argued. And actually, one of the women that I studied for my um, my doctorate, and um, one of well, one of my women, my favourite women, um, was a lady called Alice Mann, and she was a printer in Leeds, which is how I came across her. So she was a printer and a bookseller. Um, but as I sort of started to dig into her her life story, um, she was a radical woman. She, her and her husband had both been part of the Chartist movement. Her husband died quite young and she took over the business that I think from what I can understand that they had been involved in together. And uh, they had a number of children. Uh, one of them was kind of only a baby when he died. And the next year um, she appears in court and she's charged with selling papers without the penny tax. Um, and then also printing sort of material that was deemed to be dangerous and things like this. So she's, I think she's up in court three or four times and she's given the option to pay a fine. And she's told if she can't pay a fine, she has to go to prison. And she says she'll go to prison. And so she goes to York prison for, um, I think six months, leaving behind a, a baby essentially with, with her other older children. So she was radical. She did believe, you know, that that, that was what she should do. And, and that was how she would, Sort of bring um bring attention to the cause and, and to further it you know she was very much embedded in that kind of northern network of, of chartish radicals so she, the, her co-defendant was joshua hobson in that case um but then she's also kind of a businesswoman and a mother and she actually holds sort of all these official um positions as like printer to leeds council and things like this so she's not you know just because she's involved in that radical activity that's not her only the only hat that she wears um, but but the Chartists had originally been, you know, for votes for everyone, it should be universal suffrage. And then it was deemed that actually, you know, maybe we'll go for universal male suffrage first. And then when we've got that, it will be easier to get the women. So there was a sense that if you kind of 
cut that campaign down, you've got more chance of being able to progress it through. So there was that that pragmatic, you know, element, um, you know, as well. But I think you do get people that just want to burn the whole system. And then you have people that you say that, that have that kind of sense that we need to be very practical with this and kind of edge things through um, slowly. I don't know. Absolutely. And, and you know, I, I think the other thing with, with, with you know, that particular woman, that, that particular printer kind of highlights as well is the danger of us as historians and legal historians and legal academics whatever, of just taking one aspect of a person's life or one aspect of a person's character and running with it. Um, because you know it, it that that's so so dangerous because actually that's you know and, and, and actually so counterproductive because we know from our own experiences that's not how people are no. you know we, we, we know that people are, are, are walking messes of contradictions right yeah, I um, think, you know. um, a really nice example of that actually is Caroline Norton mm. so um and I, I, I sort of kind of almost hesitate to make this argument because she's almost a, so got sainthood status, I think, now because of, you know, campaigning in terms of her women's rights. But when um, I was reading an article recently for some of the research um, by Olive Anderson, who described her as, um, you know, histrionic, and she'd inherited the histrionic um, character of her playwright grandfather and things like this. And she was scathing of it because she was saying, you know, actually, she's got this kind of place in history now, the way that we remember her um, as being a sort of, radical campaigner for women's rights, for married women's rights and for infant rights. And she did do that. But at the same time, she was looking for help for people like her. She wasn't saying all women should have access to their children. She wasn't saying that all women should have access to divorce. She wasn't saying all women should have the vote or anything. You know, that was sort of decades off of, mm. you know, sort of being on, um, you know, most people's radar. But what she was doing was very much looking to keep the state, the wider status quo the same. She just wanted this kind of very specific thing. And, and I think we've, um, we as kind of a, a field have, do run that risk sometimes that we, we take these sort of characters. And then when the stories are distilled down um, to be told in sort of, I don't know, um, kind of school education or public history and things like that, it can be quite easy for them, for history to be split, you know, into the goodies and the baddies. And so the kind of nuances of those, um, you know, those sort of people's lives and, and the different hats that they wore and the different ways that they approach subjects, it, it can get lost. It's quite easy for that to, to disappear. Yeah, and, and, and not just school and public history. I mean, um, Rose Makamuti and Erica Rackley, um, one of the things they write about in terms of feminist legal history is the need to avoid what they term the heroin yes. um, idea, you know, of, of, of painting the thirsts in, in, you know, first women to do various different things in sort of angelic lights, um, and 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 yeah, because it's it's sort of, I mean, the reason to avoid this isn't just not obviously to be accurate, but is also because again, it's kind of like the perception of statutes. If you only look at high court decisions, but you're then missing nuances of their character which can help provide explanations for what they did and what they didn't do. So it's, 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 it's more than just a, you know, a, a, a sort of a need to be accurate for its own sake point. It's also a potential pitfall in terms of discovering the past as it was, because we have this kind of idea um, that sort of you know the past is simpler than the present um and, and 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 so you know we accept simple narratives about the past in the way that we wouldn't accept simple narratives about the present and about sort of you know people involved in activism today or people involved in power today you know you wouldn't present that in a very sort of superficial goodies and baddies kind of way um, I think there's quite a strong narrative, um, in my limited experience with legal history, that there is, um, that developments in, in law and in statute are a progression of, in terms of improvement, hmm. you know, that 
the all these small increment incremental changes that you know amendments or new acts and, and sort of things like that that they're they're building towards something better they're they're always good or always an improvement and i don't think that's the case you know i think we need to be quite critical of narratives that that come in like that and actually that i think that again is why legal history is so important because to have a, a critical analysis of what's existed and what's existed in the past kind of it does inform especially in law of the present and mm. um, I, gave, I gave a paper on um, some research engine into um, 19th century divorce uh, law and uh, a law school and this, one of the comments was but you know divorce in in the 21st century isn't related to this it's it comes from the 1969 it's in 1969 I think a divorce act and it was definitely 1960s um and I was thinking, but where do you think that came from? You know, and, and to me as a historian, I can see a very clear line of progression from, well, even before the 1857 Act. I think and Henry Cadd deals with this really well in his new book, you know, how actually there was a lot more kept the same than, than was radically different from 1857. But, you know, I can see a really, even to the way that we have divorced today, like there's, there's sort of mucky fingerprints of Victorian policymakers all over it. Um, you know, so that, that made me laugh that there was, you know, the kind of idea that, that sort of laws suddenly spring into existence at some point. And to be fair, if you're working in, you know, 2022, as we are now, um, you know, laws from the 1960s might feel like history. Hmm. But, you know, there's that, there was always that bigger view, isn't there? Absolutely. And I think that sort of those ideas of progress, um, which Robert Gordon describes as sort of evolutionary functionalism. So the idea that sort of, you know, things are always getting better and the basic um, default of law and society is that it functions well, it things sort of, you know, work. Um, I, I think, you know, the lesson to our law students from legal history is not just that that's what, that myth, that narrative was dominant in the past, it's dominant now. You see it all the time, this idea that sort of, you know, everything is, is, is definitely, getting better, Every, everything is, is, is evolving in a particular way. And it's, it's, it's one line, you know, it, 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 it's a unique, it, it, it's it's absolutely. So I, I think, yeah, you know, spotting that in the past is an easier way of then being able to go, ah, oh, yeah, that also happens now. Yep, and this is a problem. And I think just that the same as I was talking about there, kind of the fact that in the 19th century, people making the laws, people upholding the laws, people enforcing the laws, people defending the law, everybody is male. Mm. And they're nearly all white and they're virtually all middle, upper middle, you know, aristocratic in some cases. You know, there's there's clear kind of, um, there's a clear demographic, if you like, of people involved in those decision make, decisions that are being made. And it's not that dissimilar now. You know, there's still a tendency for that to be the demographic of people involved in the law. Um, and it matters. I really think it does matter that, that that's the case. Um, you know, I, when we sort of um, talk, talked earlier about, you know, how the, the laws are perpetuated because it suits the people that are in power. You know, if you don't have anybody who's got experience of certain things, you know, there's things I definitely don't have experience of, you know, um, then it's very difficult to be able to make laws that effectively, you know, bring about change it in that area, um, you know, I, I just I was quite struck actually in your um, in your book about the the legal geography section. I really enjoyed um, the ideas in there. And it's something that's tying into the re research that I'm doing at the moment um, into protection orders that existed under the 1857 Act. And again, it's like a big kind of evolutionary circle for my research because I first come across it in my um, a protection order in my PhD research um, and to quickly I'm sure you know but a protection order is just um, where a woman was able a married woman was able to go to court um, under section 21 of the matrimonial um, sorry the divorce and matrimonial causes act to be able to protect any income that she'd earned since since her husband had deserted her so you had to be, be able to prove desertion and then your money could be ring fenced um, and there were also some important um, bits within that, that within that sort of section that said, actually, a married woman who has one of these protection orders goes back to femsole status, which is really important because then she was able to sue, to be sued, to contract credit. She could basically do everything except remarry 
So they were important pieces of protection to get. Um, they were also easy to get. You could get one from a magistrate's court. And this is where kind of the, um, you know, compared to a divorce, which would have to come from, um, from the divorce court in London. And this sort of sense of geography is like turning out to be really important in this, um, in this piece of research, because when you look at cases um, that were heard in the South, so in the magistrates courts in London, um, it's really difficult for women to prove that the judges are sticking like, you know, glue to the letter of the law. They're having to be, they're being very exact about how long they've been deserted for, or if they were hit or beaten or treated badly before the husband deserted, they were told to go to the divorce court and get a full divorce. And, you know, the price difference in these things was astronomical. So it was, you know, it was a major blow to be sent from the magistrate's court to the divorce mm -hmm. court. Um, whereas in the Northwest um, and in the Northeast, when you look at the people that are, the cases that are reported in newspapers, you know, women are coming and saying, oh, my husband disappeared last Wednesday. And the judge goes, OK, here you go, have a protection order. And away they go. And whether that's down to the geography of the fact that the courts in the North are being very pragmatic and realise that people are not going to go mm -hmm. to, to the South, to, to London, to go and get a full divorce. And so they're working in a way that they can or not. I don't know yet. I'm doing more research, but the... Um, you know, the, the notion of geographical location and um, access to kind of to courts and the imagination of space, you know, even if we say, well, you could always apply for like the kind of pre-equivalent, you know, the equivalent of pre-legal aid, or, you know, you could see a local solicitor who can fill in the paperwork for you. If people can't conceptualize the space that between their home in Blackburn and, and the divorce court in London, then actually they're existing in a completely different legal world, aren't they, to somebody who's living in the South and can easily imagine popping to London for the day and, and doing this. So, um, yeah, I think the, the idea of space in the law is incredibly interesting. Yeah, it, it, it's another way of sort of that playing with law <laughs> idea and also that sort of one thing I think we, we, we've touched upon implicitly but haven't explicitly said it is, of course, that your ability to play with law will depend upon your situation. <laughs> will depend upon, you know, ascribed and achieved status. Um, and, and yeah, you know, and also the variation in terms of different applications of the law in different places. I mean, you know, it, it sort of how common is the common law? Um, actually, you know, yeah, the, the, these are very, very important questions, which again are asked because it's coming to the law from a different perspective and it's sort of you know what's refreshing is 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 that it's it's sort of it's decentering the law in terms of the analysis if that makes sense whereas sort of a lot of sort of doctrinal legal history or doctrinal legal stuff the focus of the attention is on the law and i think that as a result of that you kind of miss quite a lot of the stuff around the law which in many, many situations is more important than what the law actually says. I am conscious though, that there's definitely a place for those people who keep law oh. in the centre, because I know I've um, a long suffering colleague in the law school at Northumbria that I keep emailing her really stupid questions and saying, I'm really, what does this court do? Like, what does this mean? Um, because like I say, there are de there's definitely misconceptions within the, his like, the historiography of, of 19th century women because there's been misunderstandings and once one person has a misunderstanding and it becomes an important article or book in that field then those misunderstandings are kind of perpetuated and and it can kind of um it can quite often blinker what research goes on to happen because you think oh well so and so who's really important has said that that can't happen so therefore I'm not going to go look for it and if you don't look for it you don't find it so I do think that there's there's a really important place for um for those works where everything is laid out very clearly. And like as I mentioned briefly, I think um, Henry Carr's new book on English um, divorce reform, I just found that so helpful for my research because he doesn't look so much at the kind of outside noise, if you like, of, of what's going on, but um, but everything to do with, with the law and the reforms. And actually what I found really interesting was the characters of the judges and the politicians who were involved in, in making those decisions and in, enacting those decisions you know he looks 
very closely at them and the kind of being, um, I think he actually describes it as the characters of the divorce courts. So when different judges are sitting, how the sort of decisions that the court makes can be seen as, you know, different depending on who has been in charge at those points. So, um, yeah, so, you know, books like that have definitely, definitely got a place. Oh, absolutely. And sort of that, that sounds fascinating. Of course, you know, one of the main themes of the subversive legal history book is the fact that it's not about saying one type of legal history, one type of history is better than the other. It's about saying that, look, these different types are complementary. Um, and but to get you know, a, a fuller picture, you need to talk um, is, is, is basically, and you know, works like that book is sort of are, are quite difficult to characterize in terms of the sort of the distinctions which often put forward in the field. And I, I, I think that's a good thing because, you know, that highlights, I think, the sort of distinctions between sort of contextual and doctrinal or whatever the distinctions may be. They are not watertight distinctions, you know, yeah. and actually, you know, we should be wandering from one to the other and back and forth at the time, whilst obviously knowing um, that certain people have expertise in one rather than the other but, but an aspect of it and then drawing upon that expertise yeah i think um, it's because, a, it, oh sorry i was just gonna say, uh, i think it's a, it's a um a flaw maybe of our university system that actually the, sort of the humanities and law generally exist in different schools you know i can't i can't think off the top of my head of an institution where they're in the same faculty i don't think that they might well exist but certainly you know um in the university as I've worked at, law has generally had its own its own faculty. Sometimes it's with business or, you know, whatever, but there's, and because they're in different faculties, that means that the kind of um, conversations between staff perhaps don't happen as frequently as they might do um, otherwise, but also the conversations between students don't either. So, you know, I think it's a point that you make really clearly in your book that, you know, a law degree exists in a very sort of, um, similar format regardless of what institution you study, whereas a humanities degree can vary, well, it does, it varies incredibly widely depending on who's in the department. And actually within the, um, even within the same institution from, you know, five year breaks, it can be radically different because people might have moved on or, you know, change research topics and things like that. So there isn't the kind of same set understanding that, that the, the, the lawyers, you know, um, sort of maybe enjoy, but actually that cross fertilization of ideas is, again, back to geography, isn't it? It's kind of in a very small way, you know, separate because they're existing in separate biz um, separate buildings. Mm. Uh, you know, so I think we we need to be conscious of that and make more, um, maybe try and create more opportunities for that to happen. Absolutely. And, and it's sort of, it's interesting, isn't it? But sort of, that also applies in relation to the literature. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in a sort of a, a slightly more, nuanced way actually because we sort of there is cross citation and, and cross fertilization but there's also a sort of that occurs at, at the lower level if that, if that makes sense in, in terms of you know lawyers and historians have their separate canons if I could put it that way you know yeah. their, their separate sort of leading works um and then sort of beneath them sometimes you know it, it's 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 there's some sort of cross citations, but and and and, and readings of work of other disciplines, but it's sort of it it's it's quite noticeable in terms of the, the go to the defaults. Yeah, are and I think you have your methodology of searching as well. I actually had this recently. I was writing an article um, on legal history and had sent it to a colleague in the law school to read and get feedback on. And then it came back and, and she said, well, what about, you know, these like four other books on divorce? And I think I said, you know, this, this sort of um, work of um, sort of two, histor uh, two historians legal slash legal scholars. And they, they suggested these are the books that I just literally never heard of. And it wasn't through a lack of searching for, for literature. It must just have been the way that I was you know, part to do with the way that I'm used to looking for things. Um, so historians will do a lot of following through footnotes and, you know, they sort of JSTOR searches and things. But I just had no idea that these works even mm. existed. Um, now I do. So that's good. <laughs> but, it was, but it is, uh, you know, as soon as you sort of um, hand things over to, 
sort of uh, conscious of it with this with this article I've been working on I had you know historians look at it for me and then um legal scholars and the comments were completely different you know this sort of um so I'm hoping that because I followed both of them it's not going to be savaged too badly but the um you know that the, it really was striking how the different bits that that each could pick up on and um you know connected to disciplines yeah and, and I you know the danger then is that sort of without those conversations we all end up reinventing the wheel yeah. um because you know we're, we're not aware of it I mean, it's, it's and, and that's partly a frustration with the fragmented nature of legal history is that it's very difficult to actually know what's going on in the field of legal history because they're sort of the classical doctrinal field which you can keep an eye on because there's certain book series and there's certain journal journals which publish that stuff so you know that that's fairly easy to keep a tab on um but then all the stuff that's being done by people who don't necessarily call themselves legal historians but work in law schools how do you keep an eye on that um how do you keep an eye then on on the stuff that's been done outside law schools mm -hmm. you know it's 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 sort of it it it, it it's a real issue in terms of you know how to grasp all that and also it, it it reveals very different conclusions about the state of the field mm -hmm. because it's very easy you know obviously this is you know, in the book but it's it's very easy to look at one level at legal history and go it's a very small die-in discipline um but it's also very possible to look at it in a completely different way and go, oh my God, there's more his legal history going on now than ever. Yeah, um, I, I, don't, I don't think there's many historians that coming from a history background that would necessarily describe themselves as legal historians. Mm -hmm. And actually, I noticed that in your um, your other uh, sort of interviews that have happened. I think we've all introduced ourselves by saying we're not legal historians, you know. Um, but, but equally, at the same time, I think kind of I've always been a legal historian. You know, I've always used the law and examined the law as part of the work that I've done. Um, so, yeah, part of it is a definitions thing, isn't it? And a label and how that, that becomes mm -hmm. helpful. So there's very few people working in history that won't make mention of any statutes or have, or there be, you know, any of those kind of decisions by courts that haven't had an impact on them. You know, very Abs few. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's, it's that thing of who who knows what the reason behind that is but you know it's it's possible that the way in which legal history has developed as a sort of a, a set field and as a canon is to blame for that um it's possible that it's a modesty thing in terms of seeing sort of you know the expert legal historians and thinking well i'm not one of them um yeah, I think we're but all frank. We're going to get asked about laws. That's yeah, yeah. <laughs> no or, one wants to put themselves up. And, and and lawyers are concerned, but the second they say they're interested in legal history, they're going to be asked about anything that's ever happened to do with law. Um, so yeah, it, it 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 might be a terminology thing. It might be a sort of a and and again, I I don't think the legal geographers um, have that issue because they don't call themselves legal geographers. For a start, you know, it's it's it, it's it's that kind of legal history in law schools has always been an sort of an institutionalized thing, um, and and that I think proves has proved to be quite dangerous because that that then by its nature excludes, yeah. um, and and you know a lot of the conversations we've been having today are conversations which you know people who are working on doctrinal histories of the 19th century would benefit from in terms of you know it, 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 it's about it, it's you know it's it's the blind man and the elephant um parable in terms of you know every, everyone is, is, is feeling the different parts of the elephant and coming from different conclusions about what this thing is in front of them um whereas sort of if they talk to each other they might actually realize it's an elephant um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I mean that, that that's absolutely fascinating stuff. So, you, so your current work is more in relation to um, marriage and divorce, isn't it, and, and the history of that? Yeah. So I've got one project on the go, which is looking well and taking a new approach to um, 
the petitions to the uh, court for divorce and matrimonial causes. So I was again, this was a rabbit hole I fell down in um, the National Archive was when I was looking at the the uh, lady who was bankrupt after she'd been um, sued by her lover's wife. Um, I was reading their divorce files and thinking, these are amazing. There's so much stuff in here. Um, and tried to find somebody who had worked on because I figured there must be, you know, a huge literature out there. And there really isn't. There's not not an awful lot written um, about them. And certainly most people have used, might have looked at individual case files for interest, you know, particular cases that have been interesting either to the development of divorce law or, um, you know, celebrities of scandalous um, divorce cases. But there's there's very few people who have looked at them kind of holistically. Um, Gail Savage has taken um, a sort of sample and looked at occupational backgrounds. So some really interesting stuff there, actually, about the, the fact that many more of the petitioners were working class than we have previously imagined. Um, Denia Wright did an interesting study of, um, I think, the first nine years of records and looking at sort of average costs and things like that. But no one's looked at like the full spread yet. So that's what I'm hoping to do. Um, and actually, Ginger Frost has done some interesting work recently where she has used newspaper records as a way of creating an index. Because it's one of the big problems with the collection is that the index is really rubbish. <laughs> um, so it kind of it doesn't really give you any information other than their name. So and the year that it happened. So you can't create a cohort based on any um, any characteristic. But what she's done is um, use the Times newspaper um, records of divorce to try and create an index. Um, of people of colour who appeared in the divorce records. So she's um, sort of used that to, to be able to create an index um, to use, but they've really not been like, exploited in, <laughs> in a kind of um, very mercenary way. Um, but as I was reading them, you know, kind of as a previous sort of economic and business historian, um, my brain was just thinking there is so much data here that can be kind of stripped out. So I've kind of, um, that's what I'm working on. I've got four key kind of strands at the moment. And um, the first strand looks at um, domestic abuse and how that was articulated in petitions um, and treated by the courts, because although the terminology that we use today of domestic abuse and coercive control and things like that wasn't used then, the behaviours are present and they are addressed by the court and they were seen as problematic. So I'm particularly interested in how in how that's dealt with. Um, the second strand looks at the evolution of um, child custody. So like I said earlier, they could have, the legislation seems quite progressive on that in that by the 187, um, yeah, 1870s, the, the sort of court is looking at what's best for the child, not what's best for either parent. Um, and the petitions contain some information about um, sort of discussion between the two parties as to who should have the child and, and um, maintenance payments for them and things like that. So that's kind of another strand. Um, the third strand is about the cost of divorce, because although we you know, talk about it being a lot cheaper post 1857, and it absolutely makes sense that it is, there's no sort of quantitative data on what those costs actually were. So, you know, how much did it cost to pay for a solicitor to deal with this? How much, you know, um, did it, you then have to pay for the barrister? How much were the court fees? So again, this is harking back to my kind of economic interest. And then the, um, the final strand is looking at the development of the family law sector. Because um, it kind of struck me from, again, from a business perspective that in 1856, there is virtually no family law the industry, there's no business. In 1858, the divorce court opens and all of a sudden, these entrepreneurial solicitors and barristers set themselves up as family law firms. And um, so, you know, where do they come from? Who are they and, and how do they, I want to see whether there's this sort of development of, you know, bigger firms where they're recognized, you know, you have sort of um, big names now that, that take on the celebrity divorces and things which will remain nameless, but they, you know, do we see an evolution of that in the 19th century? So they're kind of the four strands that I'm, I'm working on um, with that project. So it'll keep me busy that, for a while. <laughs> that, 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 that sounds fascinating. I can't wait to, to, to find out what you discover in relation to that. But that sounds um, sort of as if there's a whole host of other sort of revelations and, and, and sort of unmaskings to occur. I hope in, so. <laughs> in, 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 in the same way as, as, as the previous work. And like I said earlier, it's 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 very much about sort of taking something that we think we know, um, or assume that it's sort of just 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 there, yeah, um, and, and and sort of shining a light on it in a way which, you know, um, hasn't been done before. But there's so many of those sorts of questions. I mean, it, it's 
particularly interesting to hear the way in which you are framing those issues um, and also applying that sort of economic background to it, um, which I think means that you, the way in which you're approaching it is sort of also unique and likely to to really raise things which and to notice things which others wouldn't um so that's that, it. it is very data driven you know this sort of this one central database that i'm hoping you can you know interrogate in different ways to um to bring out new things hopefully <laughs> which itself is is an approach which isn't that dominant in law and indeed mm -hmm. not that dominant in, in in legal history so i think that there's sort of you know there's there's methodological um advances and dare i say methodological papers which could be written uh, <laughs> on this too which which sounds fantastic well thank you ever so much uh, no, for joining me uh, for a subversive talk about your research i mean it sounds absolutely fascinating i've learned a huge a great deal and also it, it's it's sort of it's done what good history should do in this made me rethink um <laughs> on, on on a number of of of, of different fronts so thank me uh, no, no, not thank me. Thank you. Uh, so you, you, that's that's the effect. Um, it, 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 it's blown my mind and my ability to speak, uh, which is clearly um, a sign that the conversation needs to come to an end. Um, but thank you ever so much for joining me today and uh, I look forward to seeing where your research goes next. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.